Welcome back everybody to a next, another lecture here in History 1301. And last time we went over colonial America and the establishment of the original 13 colonies. And today we're going to move a little bit forward and start focusing on what the American colonies will look like as they begin to take shape and as we move into the 1700s or the 18th century. And today the main topic that we're going to be focusing on is how revolution, wars, and revivals are going to play an integral part in eventually developing a very unique colonial identity that will lead us down the road to establishing eventually a unified nation. Now, first off, before we get started, I want to talk about that first term, revolution, and how it's going to shape America, or I should say the colonial America, during the late 1600s, early 1700s. Now, when I'm referring to revolution here, I'm not talking about the American Revolution, but rather I'm talking about the Glorious Revolution, which is where we are going to begin. Now, by the end of the 1600s, during the 1680s and the 1690s, colonial America was well established. However, it is about to be rocked by events that will develop back over in England, in particular, centering around the English crown. <clears throat> now, we've talked very briefly about some English kings, but during the 1680s, or at least at the beginning of that decade, the individual who's going to control the British monarch is going to be that of King Charles II. However, but during the early 1680s, he's going to start to do something very interesting towards the end of his reign. We'll actually start to see that he will begin to consolidate and centralize authority for the monarch. Now, in regards to the King of England, really quick, to what this means for him, we need to understand what the King of England was in English society at this point. Now, most European powers, mainly France and Spain that we've talked about before, they have what's known as an absolute monarch, to where the monarch himself, the king, has absolute authority over his realm. Whatever he says goes. However, that's not exactly the case in regards to the British monarch. The British monarch ruled jointly with Parliament. Now, what Parliament is, is an elected body by mainly wealthier individuals at this point in history who will represent the population. Now, they will dictate things like taxes as well as other laws, but they take a lot of power away from the king. But by the 1680s, after Charles II is restored to the crown um, a couple decades prior to this, he wants to become essentially an absolute monarch. Now, he begins that process of centralization of power for the monarch, but it will be under his successor, that of King James II, that this centralization of power to develop an absolute monarch will accelerate. Now, the English people, as this was beginning to develop, especially as we see this new king to power uh, come to power in King James II, they're not going to very much like this because they like having these rights with Parliament because they saw themselves, including the English colonists, I might add, as the freest people on the planet because of this representative-type government, even if there were limitations to it. However, nonetheless, we'll see when this new king comes to power, even with their apprehensions, they're going to kind of blow them off. Now, initially, what will spark the Glorious Revolution will center around this idea of the centralization of power, but it's also going to center around religious beliefs that are adopted by uh, King James II. Now, on his deathbed, King Charles II is going to adopt Catholicism. Now, we have briefly talked about this before, but England is a Protestant country. They have the establishment of the uh, Church of England. However, with Charles II on his deathbed, there's a prospect that England could perhaps go back to being Catholic if the king were to influence events. And he will convert to Catholicism on his deathbed, and his heir, James II, will be a devout Catholic. And this is something else that's going to strike a lot of fear into many people over in England. However, they believe that James II, his reign would be relatively short, and ultimately his heir to the throne, that of one Princess Mary, she was strictly Protestant. She was married to a Protestant prince over in the uh, Netherlands, and we'll talk about him here in a second. But anyways, they believe that King James II coming in at a very, uh, I don't want to say old age, but coming in at middle age, he would have a short reign and there would be Protestant, a uh, Protestant princess who would be restored to the monarchy. However, that's going to all change in 1688, in June to be specific, because in that month of that year, King James II, his wife is going to give birth to a son, which becomes clear to the people of England that when the son is being raised, he will be raised as a devout Catholic. And he will be the next in line, not his uh, daughter Mary over in the Netherlands, but rather his son would be next in line for the British crown. And this is going to essentially outrage the people back over in England and lead us down the road to revolution. 
Now, the aristocrats who are in charge of Parliament, they want to throw James out of power. And this is where they're going to appeal over to Mary, the daughter of uh, James, as well as to her husband, William of Orange, who was over in the Netherlands, to bring in an, an army, invade the British Isles, and they would give him over the British crown if he kicked out James II. Now, if you are William of Orange, you're going to take advantage of this because you could become a king in your own right over the British nation. And by the end of the year, we'll see that um, William will bring over an army of roughly about 21,000 men that will invade England. However, it's not going to engage in a large battle to take the throne because most of the English people were on side of putting William into power as well as his wife Mary, as, a re as opposed to accepting uh, James II as the king. This is known as the Glorious Revolution or also the Bloodless Revolution because when William and his army arrives outside of London, they will basically be handed the crown and we'll see that James II would be forced into exile. But nonetheless, this ensured that Protestantism would reign supreme over the English people. Not to mention also as a result of this revolution, it ensured that the people, not the king, held the power within Britain. And we'll see, especially when we talk about this movement known as the Enlightenment a little bit later on, this is going to influence political ideas that are gonna come out of this period and give birth to what we would recognize today as modern, li um, modern liberalism. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second. But nonetheless, the Glorious Revolution, as it was rocking um, uh, England itself to its core, it's also going to have a tremendous impact on the colonies. Now, in the midst of uh, King James II's centralization to power, we'll also see that it will extend over to the American colonies. Now, the American colonies were the example of where we see power being given over to the people. Each one of the 13 colonies had their own elected assembly to where they could elect their own officials, issue their own taxes, and so on and so forth. Well, to consolidate his power also in the colonies, we see under James II the formation of a super colony known as the Dominion, which was meant to resemble the vice royalties that you would see over in the Spanish Empire to where the royal governor appointed to the super colony would directly uh, consult with the king, not with parliament, not with the uh, people of the colonies, but rather with the king. And once again, it was a part of that idea of centralizing his power. Now, the Dominion itself, it will engulf most of the northern colonies that we see on the Atlantic seaboard, and it will reject their royal charters. We'll see that Massachusetts, Plymouth, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Delaware, uh, New York, as well as several others are going to be engulfed into this Dominion. And on top of that, the, uh, the King of England is going to appoint a very unpopular governor who, while he may not be Catholic, he will try to impress a pro particularly on the Puritans his Anglican beliefs from the Church of England and who will also begin to override those colonial assemblies and disband them. The individual that will be appointed as the governor for the Dominion will be Edmund Andros, and he will become wildly unpopular. Now, as he's beginning to centralize his power over in the colonies under James II's reign, by the spring of uh, 1689, this is where we'll start to see events will go against Andros as well as the Dominion. By the spring of uh, 1689, word of that glorious revolution that occurred back over in England was beginning to arrive back in the colonies. And by April, three of the colonies are going to rise up in a revolt against the, uh, basically the British overseers that were left over from King James II. Not to mention, they're gonna be pretty upset with uh, Edmund Andros because he was trying to hide word of these uh, rumors that William had taken power. But anyways, beginning in April of 1689, we'll see that Boston would forcibly arrest Edmund Andros and throw him into jail until William established his authority in the region, hoping that he would reestablish those colonial assemblies. On top of that, New York would also stage his own revolt, what's known as the Lesler's Rebellion, which actually in the long run would not look to institute colonial rule in the sense of these colonial assemblies, but rather would establish a dictatorship. But that uh, rebellion would eventually be struck down by William when he arrives over, um, or when his forces arrive over in the New World. And lastly, there will also be another rebellion as a result of this down in Maryland, which will be really successful in reestablishing colonial law and colonial rule within that region. Now, by the time that William has taken power back over in England, and he can start to kind of centralize his power out in the colonies, he won't be in favor of many of these colonists who were in support of him who were rebelling. He'll actually try to keep together the dominion for the time being. However, over time, he realizes that he can't hold on to this stance. Because if he were to do this, he's just only going to piss off the colonists even more. And he recognized that the colonies were extremely vital 
to not only his government, but ultimately to the system that he wanted to employ, because he wanted to ensure that these colonies would become an integral part to the English Empire, soon to be British Empire, that was about to be born during the 1700s. He recognized that these colonies produced large profits for the empires and produced cash crops like tobacco, like rice and indigo, that were extremely valuable for his uh, government. And if he were to uh, basically displease these individuals, he could derive himself from the source of revenue. Not to mention, on top of that, with these individuals, if they consider themselves subjects of the British crown, he could also tax them. So that way he could use their taxes to fund his wars that he was about to begin back over in Europe. Now, in order to gain support for these colonists, he's going to have to give a lot of concessions. And in order to gain their support, especially to get those taxes that he will need for uh, funding his wars, he's going to have to agree with these colonists to reestablish their old uh, colonial governments as well as their own old royal charter, so we no longer would have the Dominion, but rather we'd have you know, the colonies of Massachusetts, New York, and so on and so forth. And also, he will allow those colonial, colonial assemblies who had long practiced taxing their own people to continue to dictate their own tax code. As opposed to Parliament, it would be the colonial assemblies who would tax the colonists, and in exchange for that, those taxes would go back to Great Britain and then be used to fund some of these wars that were about to explode during the 1700s, mainly between the British as well as the French, and we'll get to that here in a second. And so William, uh, or, uh, King William, he initially saw that these individuals over in the colony should play an integral part within the empire. And we'll see that this is why he will look to establish good relations, something that future monarchs will try to do. However, that will break down over time. But anyways, before we move on to those global wars that would be fought as a result of this uh, policy that was being put forth by William, the last thing I want to address about the Glorious Revolution, what you need to know about it, this is where we'll see power will go to the people. Shortly after the Glorious Revolution, we'll see that the Enlightenment is going to begin to uh, go full stream. And we'll talk about the Enlightenment here in a second, but anyways, with the end of the Glorious Revolution, the people, as mentioned before, they have the power in England. And this is where we see the birth of modern-day liberalism, mainly with a guy by the name of John Locke, who's going to put forth three natural rights that he believed that the people, in the, uh, not only in the British nation, but throughout the world, are entitled to, and that in exchange for a strong government, these were the rights that that government had to protect. And so to write it up on the board, the three natural rights that he would proclaim in his two treaties of government in 1689, shortly after this glorious revolution, is going to one day come to influence, as my light goes out over here on the board, which will one day go to influence later writings, especially over in America. Now, the three natural rights that he put forth was um, life, liberty, and not the pursuit of happiness, but rather estate or property. And he believed that these are the three things that people living over in England were entitled to. And that if they were to be deprived of these three natural rights, then ultimately they had the power to overthrow the government. And this plays hand in hand with that idea of power to the people. And he will continue to expand on this liberal idea of extend, extending rights to the people, eventually championing uh, during the course of the latter portion of his life to extend voting rights to average British subjects. But nonetheless, that will have a tremendous impact, as we'll see in the days to come, especially for the American colonies. But anyways, moving on from the Glorious Revolution, as we had mentioned just a moment ago, King William is going to be very interested in, uh, in regards to the colonies in bringing them into the larger network of the empire, particularly to collect taxes that he would then use for what would ultimately become global wars that would be fought between Britain as well as mainly their French uh, adversaries across the English Channel. Now, by the beginning of the 18th century in the 1700s, and really you could say at the end of the 1600s as well, we already had seen that several major European powers had constructed their own empires over in the New World. We talked about New France, we talked about New Spain, as well as the English colonies. And as we see these empires begin to grow, at some point they're eventually going to clash because if you're one of these empires, you want to become the mightiest empire in Europe. And so beginning shortly after King William III takes uh, power in England in 1688, we'll see that he will engage in a series of wars with the French as well as the Spanish that will dominate the course of the next century. 
And we'll see that Europe will be in almost a constant state of war over the course of almost the next 150 years, up until the point we get to the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. And it will all begin with a conflict known as King, Phil uh, King Philip's, King William's War. Now, King William's War, as it was known by the colonists, is also the seven year, or not seven years, the nine years war that was being fought over in England. Now, many of these wars that will be, or I shouldn't say England, back over in Europe. Now, many of these wars that I'm about to talk about, they will originate back over in Europe between these two major powers of Great Britain on the one hand, as well as the French and the Spanish on the other hand. Now, at the center of these conflicts will be religion. England, we already established, was a Protestant nation, whereas we'll see the French as well as the Spanish, they will be united in Catholicism. Now, they're not going to be based solely around religion, but there will be those religious motives. But anyways, these conflicts will become not only conflicts that will be fought over in the European mainland, but they will become global conflicts that will engulf much of their colonies that we'll see over in the Americas, the Caribbean, South America, India, Asia, as well as Africa. And the first of these wars would be that of King William's War. Now, it will spill over to the colonies, but it won't have a tremendous impact, and that will be the case for these two other wars that I'm about to describe. We'll see that this war would eventually end around 16, um, what was the year, 1697, and many of the issues that had been fought over in this war are going to go unresolved. And we'll see that those lingering issues would carry on to another conflict that would begin almost five years after this conflict comes to an end. And what would become known to the colonists as Queen Anne's War, or better known to the rest of the world, the War of Spanish Succession. This will be a conflict that will engulf Europe for the course of the next 10 years. It begins as a result of the fact that we see that the French want to kind of install a um, monarch over Spain that was a member of the Bourbon family. And this conflict, like King William's War, will be spread over into the American colonies to where some colonists will see some action, but it will be extremely limited. But nonetheless, because of that system established by William, the colonists would provide troops, taxes, and other things for uh, funding these wars. Now that conflict will come to an end, but that won't be the last of these global conflicts that we we'll see fought. But then we'll see another major conflict, that of King George's War, fought over a very similar issue to Queen Anne's War. Now, King George's War will basically be the war of Austrian succession. Once again, these European powers are going to be fighting over who should be at the throne of the uh, Austrian Empire. And just like before, this fighting will extend over to the American colonies, and we'll see that the British will actually capture portions of the Hudson Bay region up in Canada. And this war will come to an end in 1748, but many of the lingering issues from that conflict will linger on and lead to another global conflict that we'll talk about in a separate video, that of the um, French and Indian War, which will truly be the first global conflict. And unlike these three wars that we just mentioned a moment ago, it will begin over in, um, it will begin over in the American colonies. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later on, but with these global wars, the colonies were becoming more of an integral part within the empire. And we see that later on, as these wars become more extensive, the British government, they're not going to just want these colonists to dictate their own taxes, but eventually they will look to tax them directly. Because while the colonists were dictating their own taxes, meaning to provide these funds for these wars, Americans don't like paying taxes back then. And likewise, we'll see that they're not going to issue widespread taxes, and we'll see that this will be a problem a little bit later on. But this process that will lead us eventually down the road to the revolution begins with these global conflicts. However, while these conflicts will have an impact on America during this period, or I should say the American colonies during this period, we'll also see that another major conflict, as I'm starting to lose power over here, we'll also see that another major conflict is going to rock, or I shouldn't say conflict, another major event is going to rock the American colonies to its core and begin to create ideas that are going to influence the creation of an American nation. All right, so the Enlightenment is going to rock the colonies by the beginning of the 1700s. Now, the Enlightenment itself, to understand it, it will begin basically at the tail end of the scientific revolution that we see engulf Europe uh, during the late 1500s and early 1600s. Now, the scientific revolution that takes place during that time period, this is where you see individuals like Sir Isaac Newton, as well as many others, begin to really challenge traditional thought and promote scientific ideas, mainly to explain how the world operates. Mainly when we think about the uh, scientific revolution, we think of uh, Isaac Newton's laws of nature, right? Every action has an equal or opposite reaction. Uh, but anyways, when the scientific revolution begins to die out by the end of the 1600s, 
we'll see that it's going to have a heavy impact on another movement that begins to emerge just as it's beginning to die out, that of the Enlightenment, which will continue to center around the promotion of those same scientific ideas of that previous revolution, but look to take that scientific method, that method of experimentation, and apply it to other aspects of life, not only to the sciences and to explain the natural world, but also to establish it to political, philosophical, and other realms to better explain the world and how to create a better society. Essentially, this is where we see individuals like John Locke look to take that same uh, philosophy promoted by the scientific method to create a more equal society, a more natural society. Hence, like the, uh, um, the rights he promoted earlier that we talked about, that of the natural rights. And it will have a tremendous impact and help birthing ideas like liberalism we talked about before, but more specifically to what will be significant for the American colonies, that of uh, individualism, to where you think of the individual self as opposed to, say, a nationalist view or so on and so forth. And so we start to see those ideas being pushed forth by the Enlightenment. Now, like all event or movements during this time, it will begin back over in Europe, and by the 18th century, the Enlightenment will hit the American colonies. Now, the individual who's going to eventually come to epitomize the uh, Enlightenment over the American colonies will be that of Benjamin Franklin. Now, Benjamin Franklin, who will become, in the uh, words of a uh, historian H.W. Brands as the first American, he will go off and begin to publish many of the scientific findings that he has within a newspaper he establishes at a young age, as well as he begins to establish that the scientific method could be applied to political and philosophical ideas. And because of his publications within his newspaper, the Philadelphia Gazette, he will become widely read. He will make several advancements, most notably when we think of Benjamin Franklin and his scientific experiments. He would help I don't want to say discover electricity, but he will help uh, find that electricity is within lightning. He would also conduct several, uh, uh, what are the words I'm looking for, scientific experiments in the fields of physics, medicine, and so on and so forth. And he will become the most well-known American by the middle of the 1700s, and we'll see how his political philosophy will also be applied to American politics around this time and leading into the American Revolution. He will also become very intriguing to the American people because he will kind of become a member of another group that was heavily influenced by the Enlightenment, a religious group, a group known as the Deist. Now, the Deist, the Deists themselves, they're going to be somewhat of a Christian sect, but they're going to be heavily influenced by these teachings of the Enlightenment, as well as these natural laws that explain the world. Now, the Deists, they're not going to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not going to be uh, atheists. They believe that there is a superior being. However, they don't know what that superior being does, and they believe that once that superior being, in this case, the Christian God, once he created the universe, he stepped back. And this is where they look to the Enlightenment state that these natural laws are what govern the universe. And this uh, belief will become widely popular. Uh, obviously, uh, Benjamin Franklin will adopt this, and even Thomas Jefferson would adopt this, as well as many other enlightened thinkers that we see back over in the United States. But with the rise of the Enlightenment, with its association with science, and with this new deist belief that's being promoted, there are going to be many Americans, especially by the 1730s, that are going to state that this was borderline atheism, that it was challenging traditional religious fever. And in American colonies, a very heavily religious society, there will be a response to the Enlightenment. And that, alignment, uh, or that response to the Enlightenment will be known as the Great Awakening or the First Great Awakening. Now, the First Great Awakening it's going to begin roughly in the 1730s. And as I mentioned before, it will be somewhat of a response to the Enlightenment, which was uh, many Americans viewed as challenging their traditional religious beliefs, especially ministers who believe this. Now, the First Great Awakening is going to begin, and it will prove to be much more emotional than previous religious, uh, previous religious movements. Now, by the 1730s, while America was a heavily religious society, while most American colonists would claim membership to some um, to some Protestant church, whether it was the Baptist, Methodist, Puritan, so on and so forth, they ultimately were beginning to withdraw from religious life. We see that there was a downfall in church membership during the 1730s, and there was a need for energy to be put back into religion. And during the 1730s, mainly led by a man by the name of uh, Jonathan Edwards, he will go on a speaking tour to appeal to Americans, to put a more emotional tone, to begin to reject ideas that were associated with Calvinism, and put forth this issue saying that all Americans and all peoples are sinners, however they could achieve salvation. Now this idea of free will, this individual experience, it's so much that is influenced by the Enlightenment, 
but two, it's going to offer a different alternative compared to the old school religion that was being practiced in the United States, especially up in the Northeast where we saw Calvinism, this belief in predestination to where before you were even born, it was already ordained that you would be, uh, you would go to heaven or hell. However, it challenges that belief and states that you have your own destiny that you can grab a hold of. And we'll see that America is going to divide into two cramps, the old lights and the new lights. And the new lights will support this more emotional style of preaching, whereas the old lights will continue to focus on more traditional religious uh, teachings. But anyways, they will become wildly popular. And by the end of the 1730s, especially with the efforts of one George Whitefield, which I'll write his name up on the uh, board because he's very significant, especially with individuals like George Whitefield, who would go on a speaking tour throughout all 13 colonies, who would begin to deliver this message from the New Light position, stating that Americans really need to, as my light goes off yet again, I apologize about that, folks, but anyways, he will go off on this mission and basically preaching that Americans need to, or American colonists need to reject their sinful ways and they can achieve salvation and so on and so forth. And he will deliver some 350 servants over the course of a calendar year, traveling some 5,000 miles throughout every single one of the 13 colonies, drawing crowds that would number in the tens of thousands. And America will become extremely religious because of this. Now, with the First Great Awakening, why it's significant for us is when it begins to wane by the 1750s, it was the first truly continental event that will engulf the American colonies. It will have a tremendous impact because moving forward, while America was extremely religiously diversive, we'll ultimately see that with the First Great Awakening, they will recognize themselves as all Christians. While they may be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Puritan, Presbyterian, or so on and so forth, they all believe in one common God. And by having this unifying message, we'll ultimately see that by unifying the nation, or I should say the colonies at this point, it'd be crucial in developing an identity. That'd be centered around individualism, centered around this new unifying belief that they were not just individual colonies, but rather one uh, united body that would carry on eventually to when we get to the French and Indian War, to where they would try to unite themselves politically. And as we'll see, they will unite themselves politically once we get to the Revolutionary War when we talk about that here in just a couple of lectures. But anyways, that brings us to an end with this lecture over revolution wars and revivals. As always, make sure that you go out, read the required materials that are posted online, as well as uh, do any outstanding assignments. But anyways, other than that, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see you all next time.